Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Cronin, and today we're exploring the science of the first person. This is a concept developed by Douglas Harding, and he wrote a book with that title. And I love this concept because it's a way of thinking about spirituality, enlightenment, and really just our understanding of reality from first principles through a scientific lens that's usually completely ignored. So the way we typically make sense of reality is through the lens of traditional science, which is really the science of the third person. It's the science of objects, of objective reality, as opposed to the science of subjects, of subjective reality. And that's great. We've made some tremendous strides with Science 3, but we have run into some mysteries and some muddles with Science 3 that only Science 1 can clear up. So really, rather than seeing them as two opposing forces, the science of the first person, what it's like to be me or what it's like to be you right now, is really a complement and a way of explaining many of the mysteries of science three, which is the science of objective reality, of the phenomena that we all see and can all agree on based on our various data points. So before we get into these mysteries and how science one clears up some of the mysteries of science three, let's draw a firm line between the two. So the first example that comes to mind for me when I think about the difference is surfing. So I was just on a surf trip in San Luis Obispo, and it strikes me how different it is to watch a surfer from a third-person point of view versus actually being the surfer in the wave from a first-person point of view. So from a third-person point of view, you watch this surfer, you see him drop into the wave, stand up, and you see him glide horizontally across the horizon. But when you're a first-person observer actually the one in the water surfing it's a completely different experience you have this oval shaped awareness you can feel the power of this undulation below you rising and then when the time feels right you stand up and all of a sudden you see yourself looking down the barrel of this wave and it's this incredibly exhilarating experience your adrenaline's rushing you can smell the salt water you can feel the power of the ocean and you really do feel like you're one with the whole workings of the cosmos in that moment it's part of why i love surfing so much but i find this is a useful metaphor when you think about any sort of experiment we run if we wanted to know what is the real essence of surfing what can we truly know about it would it be more accurate to take a third person approach where you have all these scientists looking at the surfer from different angles and they're all measuring his velocity and position and trying to figure out all these ways we can turn our observations into numbers that we can compare? Or would we find more about the essence of surfing by actually surfing ourselves and feeling what it's like to be in that wave? You know, this is essentially what the difference is between science one and science three. And you can set, extend this to all sorts of experiments in all facets of life. And many scientists have totally neglected science one. And they have put that in the realm of, oh, that's just religion, that's experience, that's subjective, so it's biased. And really not much uh, attention has been given to science one. So today in this episode, I want to clear up that imbalance and really go into what we can truly know about reality through science one, the science of the first person. Many scientists, if they're good scientists, will talk about working from first principles. That means working from what we truly know rather than taking knowledge for granted that other people may have come up with, but that we haven't really tested ourselves. And part of what makes science one so strong is that it is entirely based on first principles. It's about your own experience, which is really all you can know about reality is what you yourself have experienced firsthand. And so all of the third person objective reality experiences that we can measure through traditional science, Douglas Harding calls the endless variegated enchantments that stem from the origin of science one. So for that reason, it's ultra scientific or meta scientific, even more so than science three, because with science three, you have this implied orb of awareness that's kind of witnessing everything without really putting it back to what that source of awareness actually is. So, and you can see this with language, like a typical sentence will read, Jack sees Jill. 
well, how do we know Jack sees Jill? Where are where is the narrator? Who is the narrator? Is it some godhead floating around? So there must be someone to actually observe Jack seeing Jill. So a better, more accurate way of saying it is, I see Jack sees Jill. So now there's three people in this equation. Now, normally we don't think about that. We just think of the third person as being the most objective scientific way of describing reality. But by getting rid of that observer, you're missing a key part of the equation. So you can think about this with quantum mechanics and how it really clears up the mystery of quantum mechanics where many scientists will say, wow, there's this grand mystery. How can it be that an electron behaves as a wave, but once we observe it and take a measurement, it collapses into a single point? How can that be? How can there be this wave particle duality? Well, it's not quite accurate to say that an electron behaves as a wave and then collapses into a single point. It's more accurate to say, I see the electron behave as a wave and I see it collapse into a single point. That I see part is really important because all of reality is being filtered by your lens of conscious awareness. And when we think about what it's actually like to live life in a day-to-day -day sense, there is an endless slew of possibilities for anything you can do at any moment. You know, I could go get up, get a glass of water, I could read a book, play video games, I could do whatever I want at this moment, but whatever I choose from this wave of possibilities, I will collapse those possibilities into just one reality in the here and now. And I believe that's the same thing that's happening with quantum mechanics. So rather than just think from this third person point of view of, oh, how could that be the case? Like we're all unbiased observers seeing what's going on. How can this wave turn into a point? Let's look, at, let's look back at what our own experience is and make sense of it from a first person point of view. And here's a quote just to bring home that point of how ridiculous it is to have some third person observer, whereas there really only are first person observers that we know of. Here's the quote. Who is it that repeats the Buddha's name? We should try to find out where this who comes from and what it looks like. Now I want to go through some experiments that you can try firsthand and actually experience reality for yourself. So don't take my word for it. Try some of these experiments right now that Douglas Harding has described and you tell me what you think. So the first experiment that I love to do, I do it whenever I go for my morning jog, is running through space as opposed to having space moving through you. So when I went for a run just this morning, I would be running through space and that's the normal third person way of thinking about it, right? You are this object, you're a human being and you're traversing through space. But there's another way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is that you aren't moving at all. Space is moving through you. So you are the void at the center of conscious awareness and you are seeing these trees coming into view, you're seeing these roads, these cars, these other passerbys, but nothing is changing in, world, in your view. Everything is totally still and peaceful, and you are just experiencing the world move through you. In the words of Douglas Harding, you are space for the world. Another experiment that I like is the mirror experiment. So you can do this with a mirror or even with a selfie camera, and just look into the mirror it helps sometimes if you encapsulate just your face and you can see the difference between the reflection in the mirror, which is your third person self, and the real you, which is perceiving that reflection, the source that is actually taking in the image of your face. So that's a really easy way to just see the difference between yourself as an objective entity and the subjective you that is witnessing that. Another experiment is to view yourself as not having a head. So if you're walking through the world, maybe you're talking with coworkers or your family or whoever, if you pretend like you don't even have a head, and by the way, from your first person point of view, you don't have a head, you can't see your head, and instead you have your sense, your seat of conscious awareness as being really in your heart, then that can help you diminish your own ego and be more space for the world. So if you walk around with your heart shining outwards and pretending or realizing that you don't actually have a head, that is a great way to let your ego melt away and just be space for the world. 
Another similar experiment is the face to no face experiment. So this one you do with another person. So maybe you do it with your spouse or family member, friend, whoever it is, and sit across from them and gaze deeply into their eyes. One thing you'll notice is that you don't have your own head. You now have their face. So in your sphere of conscious awareness, you see the other person's face and they see your face. So in that sense, you've swapped faces. And this is a really good exercise for just realizing how much of an effect your state has on others. So if you go through life grumpy and miserable, you are giving a grumpy, miserable face to every single person who sees you. Whereas think of like a, a dog who's really happy to see you, their joy becomes infectious. And when you see your dog have that happy face and they're running on the ground and so excited to see you, that now becomes your reality because that's the reality that you're perceiving through your first person perspective. So I would, I would uh, urge you to try these experiments and it's one of those things that you do kind of need to practice because we've been so conditioned to think of ourselves as this objective entity in space and oh, I'm me, I have this kind of face, I look a certain way, I'm a certain gender, I'm a certain this, a certain that, but that is a huge mistake. You should only think of yourself as I. And notice how there's no different pronouns for I, whether you're a frog or a tree or a, or a man or a woman or a gay person or a straight person or any sort of ethnicity, no matter who you are, you use the same first person pronoun, I. All of the issues arise when we focus so much on the third person, the he, him, her, they, all of that kind of stuff. It just doesn't matter. If it matters to you, that's fine. You should, you know, you should be able to have your preferred pronouns, but it is a mistake to focus so much on the third person manifestations of yourself. Instead, we need to focus on the first person commonality that there is only one subject. And in the words of Wittgenstein, the subject is not in the world. Now I'd like to talk briefly about the life cycle of a person or of a subject, of a conscious entity. So you start out as an infant and in childhood as not even thinking of yourself as an object. A baby will not even realize that it's a separate entity from its environment. So if happy things are happening around it and people are being goofy and laughing, the baby will be goofy and laughing too. And if things are angry and someone drops a glass or your parents are shouting, the baby will start to cry because it doesn't see itself as separate from that which is going on around it. And as the baby gets older and as it becomes a toddler, if you ask it to count how many people are in the room, it'll say one, two, three. It'll count three other people, but it won't count itself. That's because it doesn't think of itself as a thing. It's a no face. It is the void which is really the truth of what you are. As you become an adolescent and go into adulthood, you're conditioned time and time again by society to view yourself as this separate entity. And you learn to play a certain role. You're a certain person, you come from a certain family, you have a certain way that you look, you have a certain historic background. There are all these things about you that you learn to become and integrate into part of your identity. But this can lead to alienation. And that's why many adults feel like they're alone and afraid in a world they never made. And they may feel that no one understands them. They may feel that it's just them up against the world. They may feel that it's just too much for them to bear and everything is resting on their shoulders. Now, this is a huge mistake and it's a tragic mistake. That's why ideally you get to the third stage, which is the stage of the seer. And a seer is someone who recognizes that, yes, others view him as an objective reality, and for others, he is an object in the world. But at the same time, that's not his true identity. His true identity is as space for the world. So really, as a seer, you become more like a child. And here's a quote from Jesus, unless you turn around and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Or here's a, another related one from Lao Tzu. The sage at all times sees and hears no more than an infant sees and hears. So try to recognize your true self as being space for the world, just like an infant recognizes that. 
Let's talk about the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. The worst case scenario in my mind is that we never get to that seer stage. We stay trapped in that adult stage of viewing us all as separate entities. And this can lead to alienation and it can also lead to tribalism. When we get so caught up with what we look like or what group we are put into based on our appearances or on any other sort of factors, that's when all the problems arise. So whenever we focus too much on our third person attributes, that's when you'll see one side taking up arms against another side. And this is just very problematic. So I would say that the more we can focus on our first person identity and the fact that we use the word I for everyone, and if we can really have as expansive of a sense of I as possible, that's the best path for the future. Now let's talk about the best case scenario. Best case scenario. My best case scenario is that we recognize that we are all one. And that way, we can work together. So here's a quote from Eckhart where he says, As long as I am this or that, I am not all things. Or from Ramana Maharshi, The trouble arises when one says, I am this or that. Be yourself, that is all. Or from the Upanishads, Where there is two, there is fear. I love that last quote in particular because it's so true. Anytime there is a sense of two, of there's me and there's you, or there's this group and that group, that creates problems. When we realize there really is only one, then everything is easy and we can all work together and we can all realize that we have the same goal and the same underlying experience of conscious awareness. So my best case scenario is that not only do we continue to progress with science three, but we also progress with science one and that ultimately we're able to merge the two and have a full understanding of reality that's not just limited to what we can observe and measure in the third person physical universe, but instead we actually get beyond the phenomena to the noumena, what is truly like at the source. Now let's talk about the most likely scenario. Most likely scenario. My most likely scenario is that this awakening has already begun and it will continue. I believe that we will get past our tribal behavior as people gain more insight, as they self-reflect, as we learn more through Science 3 and through Science 1. And I believe that we'll end up with a more enlightened society that creates a better reality for all conscious beings. I think that's a good place to end it. I hope you enjoy this episode. I hope you try some of the experiments. And I'll see you next time. And what will inevitably happen? The past, the present, and the future. Our computer is picking up a strange signal. The past, the present, and the future. Baby. What's the world coming to? The past, the present, and the future. If you enjoy thinking about the future as much as we do, we invite you to join the HTF community. Simply go to hencethefuture.com, scroll to the bottom of the homepage, and add your email address next to the button that says, Enter the Void. 
You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Hence the Future. And most importantly, we encourage you to please rate and review the show in Apple Podcasts if you haven't done so already. Our team reads and appreciates every single review. Thank you again for listening to today's episode and for staying curious. And we'll see you next week.